Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Star and Lily is laying right down there. And tonight we are going to summarize chapters 40 to 47 of Dickens' Dombey and Son. And then we're going to get back to chapter 48. But a reminder to please subscribe, like, and comment below and hit the notification bell. Thank you. And without further ado... Chapter 40 Summary Dombey and Edith's marriage continue to deteriorate. One night he arrogantly informs her that he is not pleased with the way she is behaving. He wants her to spend less money and behave more deferentially to him. He notices that she seems agitated when he mentions Cocker and threatens her with the humiliating possibility of ha having Cocker deliver his rebukes to her if she does not alter her behavior. He also mentions that he is making arrangements for Mrs. Skewton to go to Brighton as recommended for her help and to be cared for Mrs. by Mrs. Pipchin. Edith responds that she knows they are unsuited for each other, do not love each other, and will never enjoy a happy marriage, but that in order to make life bearable and minimize the harm to others, she thinks that they should try to lead separate lives and tolerate each other. Mr. Dombey refuses, insisting that he expects the deference and respect he has the right to demand. The next day, Mrs. Skewton, Florence, and Edith leave for Brighton. One day, while Edith and her mother are out for a walk, they encounter the haggard, and Al haggard Mrs. Brown and Alice. Edith is struck by the resemblance between herself and Alice, and also realizes that Mrs. Brown was a gypsy woman she had met at Leamington prior to her marriage. Chapter 41 Mr. Toots comes to fl fl visit Florence at Brighton, and they go to Dr. Blimber's, school together. On the walk home, Toots begin to propose, but Florence tactfully cuts him off. That night, Toots and Peter have dinner together. Toots laments his unrequited love for Florence, and Peter explains that he hopes to court Cornelia. Shortly thereafter, an unre unanguished illness, Mrs. Skewton dies. Cousin Phoenix and Mr. Dobby go to Brighton, where she is buried. Chapter 42. Rob is now directly working for Carker. He has quit working for Cuddle at Carker's instruction, but when he goes to report this, Carker skillfully manipulates him into feeling that he ought to be grateful for Carker, offering him a job now that he has none. His job is now to spy for Carker, and because he is intimidated and awestruck by his patron, he is very loyal. One day, Mr. Dombey comes to visit Carker at his home. Mr. Dombey explains his dissatisfaction with his wife, and his plan to have Carker act as intermediary if she does not change her behavior. Carker coyly manages to bring up Florence, and Dombey tells Carker to, tell, to inform Edith that he dislikes the affection she shows to his daughter. He's a selfish man. <coughs> Excuse me. After this conversation, Carker and Dombey set up at the firm's offices, but as they ride there, Dombey is thrown from his horse and badly injured, and that still doesn't change him. But I think he's coming for a... <coughs> <coughs> Carker goes to the Dombey office and insists on seeing Edith even after being initially refused. He breaks the news to both Edith and Florence. The latter is very upset. He oversees the transfer of Dombey back to his home. Edith is aware that Carker's power and influence is growing ever stronger and is humiliated and angry. Chapter 43. Florence is saddened by the tension between Edith and her father. The night he is brought back after his injury, she slips into his room to see while he sleeps. Afterwards, she goes to see Edith and is shocked by the anguish Edith is clearly experiencing. Though she composes herself when she realizes that Florence is present, Edith clings to Florence as the only good thing in her life. Chapter 44. The next morning, Susan takes advantage to Mr. Dombey's weakness state to weakened state to speak frankly to him. She angrily rebukes him for his mistreatment and neglect of Florence. He deserved it, but that didn't help. Mrs. Pipchin arrives and Mr. Dombey is furious with her for having not prevented from Susan from speaking to him in this way. Mrs. Pipchin fires Susan. Shortly afterwards, Florence learns what has happened and expresses her grief that Susan will leave. Susan explains that she will go to stay with her brother and that she has savings, 
and that she is very sorry to leave Florence. Fortunately, Toots happens to come to see Florence, and she asks him to accompany Susan to her brother's home, which she is, he is happy. He is. She is happy to do. He is happy to do. Before he sees Susan off, Toots asks if she thinks Florence could ever love him, and Susan says she doesn't think so. Well, I think Su uh, Florence is in love with Walter. Chapter 45. Carker asks to speak with Edith. She tries to arrange that Florence be present during this conversation, but he implies that he'd prefer, he'd prefer Florence not know what they'll speak about. It would hurt her. They meet in private, and in her agitation, Edith explicitly admits that there is no affection between her and Dombey. Carker pretends to take her side. Well, he's he's a snake. <laughs> Explain that Dombey is proud and stubborn, but that he disagrees with his method of trying to control his wife. Carker also tells her that Dombey wants Edith to show less affection. Florence, if she does not do so, Dombey is likely to find some way to punish Florence, because he's a cruel man. Chapter 46. Mr. Carker becomes even more diligent than usual in monitoring the business affairs of the Dombey firm. One day, Mrs. Brown and her daughter secretly watch him as he goes to work and they discuss their hatred of him. Mrs. Brown encourages her daughter to try to extract money from him, but Alice refuses, saying that she only wants to cause him suffering. So, where, 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 where? I think I lost my place here. Oh, what the heck just happened? All right. Just lost my place. We'll find it. <laughs> Get back there a sec. Yep. Okay, we'll get back there. After Cocker has arrived, Rob is leading his horse away and is approached by Mrs. Brown. And Alice, Rob is uncomfortable <coughs> talking to them, but also does not want to make Mrs. Brown angry. After Rob delivers the horse to the stables, he sits and talks with the woman, explaining that he and Carker are currently lodging near the Dombey house, so as to be close by during Mr. Dombey's recovery. Mrs. Brown asks whether Carker is close to Mrs. Dombey, and Rob expresses discomfort with the information he is revealing. Mrs. Brown makes Rob promise to come and see her from time to time and also gets him to give her money, although Alice is disgusted and makes her return it. While Mr. Carker is at the office, John Carker comes in to pick up some documents. Carker questions his brother about whether he feels resentment towards Dombey and mocks John for his claim that he does not. Carker says that everyone employed by Dombey secretly hates and resents him. John Carker disagrees and leaves Carker alone to his meditations. That night, he lurks outside the Dombey house, gazing up at it and thinking about Edith. Chapter 47 Edith and Mr. Dombey continue to be unhappy in their marriage. Florence has almost entirely given up the ho the hope of her father coming to love her, and is also saddened by the absence of closeness between her and Edith. After Dombey's accident, Florence notices that Edith had begun to avoid her, so one day she questions her. Edith will only <coughs> will say only that while she still loves Florence, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> she must be no longer as close with her as before. Edith also implies that her relationship may not have been good for Florence, anyways. After that, she only shows Florence affection in secret. On the evening before Edith and Dommy's second wedding anniversary. Florence, Dombey, Edith, and Carker all gather for dinner. Dombey announces plans for dinner the following evening to mark the anniversary, while Edith insists she has pre-existing plans. <coughs> Dombey says the Carker, the Carker will be entrusted in making her attend the dinner. Edith tries to <coughs> insist on a private conversation with her husband. <coughs> She's making a bit of a cough here. He tries to insist on a private conversation with her husband, especially since 
Florence is visibly distressed. Dombey says he has the right to shame her before others if he wants. He finally sends Florence out of the room, only when Edith accuses him, him of mistreating her, which he is. <coughs> Edith re reaches her breaking point, and in front of Carker asks Dombey for a separation. Dombey rejects the suggestion as ridiculous. Dombey also says that he is growing mistrustful of Florence's role in Edith's resistance, and that if Edith's behavior does not change, he will punish Florence. And what a horrible, horrible man he is. What a horrible, horrible man he is. And there's so many terrible people out there like that. That's more emotional abuse. But I think he was insinuating that he was going <coughs> to cut her off from her Carker suggests that perhaps a separation between Dombey and Edith would be best after all, but Dombey dismisses this possibility a second time, and the group, group go their second, separate ways. Later, when D Mr. Dombey has gone out, Florence goes to look for Edith, hoping to comfort her. She sees Carker coming downstairs alone, leaving the house. Florence is disturbed by this and retreats to her room. The next day, she does not see Edith until the evening. And when she approaches her, Edith reacts so violently that Florence faints. It's probably because she doesn't want Florence to be punished, I'm guessing. Florence, okay. <clears throat> when she awakens, she is told that Edith has gone out. And while Mrs. Pipchin urges Florence to go to bed, she decides to wait up and eat it. She waits all night, becoming more and more distressed. In the morning, Mr. Dombey is notified that his wife has not come home. Florence watches as her father calls the coachman to ask for more information. <coughs> the coachman explains that the previous night, he drove Edith to her old residence where Carker was waiting for her. He was told that Edith would not need the coach to return, and had been sent home. Uh, I'm trying to find my place. I keep losing it. Edith's maid confirms that her mistress's dressing room is locked. Furious, Dombey rushes upstairs and breaks down the door, finding all of Edith's discarded things in a letter telling him that she's leaving him for Carker, which, you know, she isn't, but there must be some sort of method or something behind that. <laughs> Dombey is shocked that he raged and runs into the street. I think that's how uh, Carker probably takes everything or something happens. When he returns to the house, Florence goes to try to comfort him, but he strikes her, accusing of her, her of having conspired with Edith. What a terrible man he is. Distraught, Florence finally accepts that her father's not a good man and leaves the house. Analysis. This section is perhaps the darkest in the novel. It unflinchingly addresses the dark possibilities that have been implied from the beginning. Are there situa situations in which there is no hope? Will individuals remain stubbornly incapable of recognizing the error of their perspectives? While Mrs. Skewton is a relatively minor character, her death adds a bleak note to the novel in that she dies without ever realizing the tragic impact her actions have had or coming to understand that her toxic view of the world was wrong. Her death therefore endorses the possibility that characters may not be capable of reform, change, or growth. And that's true. There are some people. They just never learn till the day they die, till they get to the other side and someone else has to teach them or whatever happens. The possibility looms even larger as Dombey and Edith Marriage disintegrates. While Edith can be spiteful in her behavior towards him, she proposes a number of possibilities meant to allow them to live in relative peace. She is also very concerned that Florence not being impacted not be impacted by their antagonism. Dombey, however, rejects all her attempts <coughs> trying to make conditions in her household more bearable. In his interactions with his wife, Dombey shows even more explicit coldness and cruelty than what he has demonstrated to his daughter. He demands super, 
subservience from Edith, clearly believing that his position as a man entitled him to dictate the terms of their marriage. He also uses intelligence to maximize damage since he can tell that she, she dislikes Carker. He knows it will be especially humiliating for her to have Carker to be involved in the intimate details of their life. Dombey shows that he has no compassion what he's, he is willing to make it clear that he is superior to others. He's not capable of love. I mean, he didn't even really love his son. It's just that he was a boy and he's going to take over the family. Carker also demonstrates his ability to cruelly manipulate people. He knows that Florence is Edith's weak spot and he uses this knowledge to blackmail Edith and push her into situations she would not otherwise agree to. Edith's helpless position between the two men, both of whom only want to break her to their will and don't care for her well-being, helps to create sympathy for her, which is especially important given that in the eyes of a Victorian audience, her decision to leave her husband for another man <laughs> was shocking and highly immortal, moral. That be, being said, the fact that it was Carker, even to me, it's shocking and highly immoral. Her wildness in her interaction with Florence is also important in that it demonstrates she is not taking her decision lightly and would not resort <coughs> to this drastic step if she had any other options. Her disgust with the valuable luxuries Dombey has given her also provides a kind of moral redemption. She is unwilling to sacrifice her integrity just so that she can enjoy costly clothes and and jewelry. That's sort of a what you call a high class hooker. I think that she sees herself that way, even though she's. But a lot of women back then, even now, actually, in certain societies. That that happens too. They end up marrying into a lot of, into, and it's it's like it's like a business marriage. It's not really any love. <coughs> it's been a lot of women for. It still is. But then it was, like I said, it, it was worse. And in some countries, it's still still bad. Usually third world countries, certain religions. And in even some, I mean, I mean, all, actually almost all religions. Florence is perpetually put in the middle of conflicts between her father and stepmother. And when Edith le leaves, she attempts to comfort her father. While his reaction speaks to the grief and rage, He's experienced and it is devastating blow to Florence. Years of psychological violence are fi finally manifest in the physical strike. There's also the indication of the, how their relationship is only soured as Florence has matured from child into woman. Dobby's misogynistic rage at the realization that his wife has betrayed him extends to Florence as well. Dickens carefully omits the language Dombey uses in this critical scene, but he implies that Dombey presumably used, used a sexualized slur against, against Edith, basically called her slut, probably. Well, their, their version of whatever the terms they used back then. <coughs> Perhaps explicitly making the connection to the implied reference to prostitution. To use this kind of language in front of his young, sheltered daughter be hugely taboo and constitute another kind of violence, confirming for Florence that her father has no respect for her well-being. And that is the end of this, the summaries and analysis. We're going to get on to reading chapter 48, The Flight of Florence. <coughs> Excuse me. In the wildness of her sorrow, shame, and terror, the forlorn girl hurried through the sunshine of a bright morning as if it were the darkness of a winter night, wringing her hands and weeping bitterly, insensible to everything but the deep wound in her breast, stunned by the loss of all she loved, left, left like the sole survivor on a lonely shore from the wreck of a great vessel. She fled without a thought, without a hope, without a purpose, but to fly somewhere, anywhere. The cheerful vista of the long street, 
burnished by the morning light, the sight of the blue sky and airy clouds, the vigorous freshness of the day, so flushed and rosy in its conquest of the night, awakened no responsive feelings in her so hurt bosom. Somewhere, anywhere to hide her head, somewhere, anywhere for refuge, never more to look upon the place from which she fled. But there were people going to and fro. There were opening shops and servants at the doors of houses. There was a rising clash and roar of the day's struggle. Florence saw surprise and curiosity in the faces flitting past her. Saw long shadows coming <coughs> back upon the pavement and heard voices that were strange to her asking her when she went and what the matter was, and all, and though these frightened her the more at first, and, ma <clears throat> and made her hurry on the faster, they did her the good service of recalling her in some degree to herself, reminding her of the necessity of greater composure, where to go, still somewhere, anywhere, still going on, but where she thought of the only other time she had been lost in the wide wilderness of London, <clears throat> though not lost as now and went that way to the home of Walter's uncle. Checking her sobs and drying her swollen eyes and endeavoring to calm the agitation of her manner so as to avoid attracting notice, Lawrence resolved to keep to the more quiet streets as long as she could was going on more quietly herself. When a familiar little shadow darted past, Upon the sunny pavement, stopped short, wheeled about, came close to her, made off again, bounded round and round her, and Diogenes panting for breath, and yet making the street ring with his glad bark was at her feet. Oh, die, oh, dear, true, faithful die, how do you come here? Did you come here? How could I ever leave you, die? Who, who would never leave me? Aw. Florence bent down on the pavement, laid his rough, old, loving, foolish head against her breast. They got up together and went on together, die more off the ground than on it. <coughs> Endeavoring to him, kiss his mistress, fly, flying, tumbling over, and getting up again without the least concern, dashing at big dogs in the jocose defiance of his species, terrifying with touches of his nose. Young housemaids who were cleaning doorsteps and continuous, continually stopping in the midst of a thousand extravagances to look back at Florence and bark until all the dogs within hearing distance and all the dogs who could come out came to a stare at him. <coughs> With this last adherent, Florence hurried away in the advancing morning and the strengthening sunshine to the city. The roar soon grew more loud, the passengers more numerous. The shops were busy until she was carried onward in a stream of life, setting that way and blowing indifferently past marts and mansions, prisons, churches, marketplaces, wealth, poverty, good and evil, like the broad river side by side with it, awakened from its dreams of rushes, willows, and green moss, rolling on turbid and troubled. I think I'm going to stop right troubled among the works and cares of men to the deep sea. I'm going to stop right there tonight. This is like a bit of a sore throat tonight but if you enjoyed that video please be sure to hit the like button subscribe and comment below and also stay tuned for more from chapter 48 from charles dickens dummy and his son from a star and little lily here dogs of man's best friend this is one of mine <laughs> good night